And now I have the honor to introduce from Chicago, Jennifer Johnson, who is a staffer of CTU, Chicago Teachers Union, a teacher evaluation facilitator who connects members to resources who you heard from yesterday. Also, ladies and gentlemen, I'm introducing Susan Sadlowski Garza. Come on up. A former CTU counselor, and listen carefully to this, who last May won political office as the first CTU candidate to run and win a city council seat. But let's add to this. This was an upset victory. And guess who she beat? She beat a candidate supported by none other, that's right, than Rahm Emanuel. So let's give it up. Yay. <laughs> and also joining us this morning is G2 Brown, who was born in Chicago's South Side, a product of the Chicago public school system an education organizer, parent community activist for the Kenwood Community Organizing Committee. He is also national director of Journey for Justice Alliance, a grassroots organizing group. Let's welcome our committee, our panel from Chicago, the Windy City. So welcome to, <laughs> To the three of you, welcome to the desert. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> All right. Um, my name is G2 Brown, and I uh, first want to say uh, thank you to Brother Alex and the mighty UTLA for having us here today. So give yourselves a round of applause. I want to say it's an honor to be here because anytime good people can come together to figure out how we can make the world a better place, um, it's an important day. Um, I come from, I send you greetings from the Journey for Justice Alliance. We are a national network of uh, 39 community organizations in about 24 cities, including the Labor Community Strategy Center in Los Angeles. Um, and one of the things that we've learned is that while there may be differing, uh, differing details in different cities, the goal of privatization is the same, to destroy organized labor, but also to destroy those communities in which our young people and our families come from. So I also send you greetings from the Kenwood Oakland Community Organization. I come from a neighborhood on the south side of Chicago that's called Bronzeville. Uh, this mighty community is a home, and make some noise if you recognize these names. Uh, I haven't said the names yet. <laughs> All, right. All right, but I appreciate the enthusiasm. <laughs> Sam Cook, <laughs> Minnie Ripperton, oh. Richard Wright, <laughs> Ida B. Wells, <laughs> Red Fox. Dinah Washington, yeah. Nat King Cole, oh. <laughs> Dr. Daniel Hale Williams. I can go on, but this is, uh, Bronzeville was one of the key destinations for African American families when we evacuated the South. And this community was one of America's proudest black communities in the 20th century. But we suffered from massive disinvestment, both private and municipal in this community over the last 30 years. We are 10 minutes from downtown Chicago, right off the lakefront. So you can imagine there's a G word that yeah. describes what we're going through in Bronzeville. Anybody know what that word is? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, gentrification. Now, what the issue with gentrification is not about being against change, or being against development. But what you see in a community like Bronzeville is while you build a Starbucks 
and you build a high-end grocery store, and you build condominiums that go about $400,000, you also close the grocery store that the people, you, that, uh, the people that live in that community had. You close the schools that used to serve those children. The affordable housing disappears. So what you have is a disinvestment in the basic of quality of life institutions for the people who live in that neighborhood. Am I making sense? So, from the Kenwood Oakland Community Organization, this was our fight in Bronzeville. We believed that if you want to improve communities, you invest in the people. You don't move the people you deem undesirable out of the way. So, this community is also where our President Barack Obama served as state senator. It's also where Arnie Duncan's mom still runs the after school program to this day. So it was a very high profile neighborhood and was the first neighborhood in Chicago targeted by school closings. In, 19, in 2004, there was a plan called the Mid-South Plan to close 20 out of the 22 schools in our neighborhood and turn them into either contract, charter, or what they call CPS performance schools. We began to fight back against that and, we, and with uh, the help of a coalition around the city, we stopped the Mid-South Plan in 2004. But in the wave of privatization, we know that there's no such thing as a permanent victory until we built the infrastructure to have permanent victory. So they kept coming, and they kept coming for our community. And our members, we have about 1,200 members in this community organization. And our members, we fought, and we fought. But what began to happen is they started going to other neighborhoods. And this is where I met the current leadership of the Chicago Teachers Union. So Jackson Potter, the staff coordinator, was a teacher at Inglewood High School. Jesse Sharkey, the vice president, was a teacher at Sin High School. And they were trying to turn Sin into a military academy. Brothers and sisters, I met, Coco met the leadership of CTU on the battlefield. And so as we began to work together, to stop the closing of schools in these other neighborhoods, <coughs> a relationship based on struggle developed. We weren't just working together because it's important for teachers and community to work together. We realized that we need each other. We realized that parents, teachers, and students are the people directly impacted. We're also the ones demonized by corporate education uh, uh, privatizers to say what's wrong with public education. They'll say bad teachers, they'll say these, stu these bad students, and they say these parents don't care. And that'll justify the, the, the failed reforms that they shoved down our throat in our communities. So we began to work with the Chicago Teachers Union as they formed the caucus called CORE. And this caucus was so powerful, and the work that we were doing was so powerful in shutting down school board meetings, making, uh, stopping school closings in Chicago, uh, building power in different communities, that the previous leadership of the union began to come to our, our meetings just to keep an eye on the caucus to, to make sure that, and, and so, but they weren't able to stop it. So eventually what happened is, because in Chicago, between 2000 and 2006, CTU lost 6,000 members. And CORE spoke to the, the, the needs of the teachers that were suffering in Chicago public schools. So their membership exploded. And in 2010, they won uh, the leadership of, of, of the Chicago Teachers Union, this country's third largest teacher union. But, And we formed an organizing table called GEM, Grassroots Education Movement, made up of some of the strongest community-based organizations in the city and the Chicago Teachers Union and other labor groups. And we have a campaign now for 50 sustainable community schools in the city of Chicago. We are, we are demanding that Chicago becomes a community school district instead of a choice district. Why is that important? Because since 1995 in Chicago, Chicago's been under mayoral control. We don't have an elected school board. Despite the fact after the creation of local school councils, test scores went up six straight years, the, the former mayor of Chicago invented an education crisis and then came with the idea of putting schools on academic probation. 
and he wanted to take control of the system. Academic probation was a setup for the 50 schools that closed in Chicago last year. And so, but what has been the result of this reform, right? What, since they've had 20 years to run Chicago public schools and ignore the voices of parents, teachers, and community, what's been the result? Well, here's what we know, brothers and sisters. Since 2002, only 18% only 18 percent of the schools that have replaced closed schools perform well. Let me say that again. Since 2002, only 18 percent of the schools that have replaced closed schools perform well. This means despite the fact they can pick the children they want and kick out the children they don't, fewer than 20 percent of their schools perform well. But here's the deep part and half of those schools are selective enrollment schools, right? We know that only that 75% that of charter schools perform either the same or worse than traditional public schools. So <clears throat> we are not satisfied with public education as, as we had it before privatization. But we know you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. What we have to demand is education equity because no one wants to talk about the fact that, that children in more affluent communities have a completely different educational experience than the children that you That's teach. Right. Right. Thank you. And at the Journey for Justice Alignment, that is a, the Journey for Justice Alliance, that is our demand. We are demanding 50 sustain, 5,000 sustainable community schools across the country, and we are saying that we want an end to what we are calling education colonization. That when people come in our communities, when these corporate interests come in your communities and they say that your voice no longer matters, what they are, they're just like Belgium in the Congo in the 60s. They're no different than Great, than Great Britain and the French in Senegal when Africans no longer could, could have a say in their own government. Am I making sense? Yep. So yeah. we cannot look at them as just they are good people that are doing things the wrong way. They have waged war on you, That's right. and they are waging war on our communities. When I kiss my son, and I send him to school, we should all, and when you kiss your children and send them to school, you should have a reasonable expectation that the return on your investment are stable, quality schools within walking distance of your home. And, I, I'll close. and brothers and sisters, I said this last night when I was talking to some friends, there's an African proverb that says, the truth is simple, if it's complicated, it's a lie. <laughs> so good schools are not a mystery, are they? We know what works in schools. The issue is the children that you teach are not a priority to the system that has underserved them. And so it is mandatory. So we have to deal with some of the issues that we have with each other. And we have to deal, because th this change is not going to be comfortable, brothers and sisters. In Chicago, there's nobody I argue with more than Jackson Potter. There's nobody I slam on the table with and challenge on race issues in Chicago Teachers Union. But because we are comrades, we know that we're struggling together. And so we can do that and then develop a platform that speaks to all of our needs. You, you, I, that makes sense? So it's critical, it is critical that we find a way to begin to, to say parent power, student power, teacher power equals people power, all right? Um, so I'll close with saying this. We are fighting for sustainable community schools. We are fighting for the end to tricks like appointed school boards and state takeovers. That those, are, if you look at the broad, Eli Broad Institute's training manual, which I have a copy of, <laughs> if you look at their training manual, it says that one of the necessary ingredients to school reform is elected school boards and state takeovers to clear the way for reform. But there's nothing in any piece of credible evidence that says it has anything to do with school improvement. 
the entire the reason is to eliminate your voice just like the reason for attacking your pension the reason for attacking your collective bargaining is to destroy what you represent so we in addition to wanting that we also are building the infrastructure for political power so we have to begin to develop develop and elect the type of elected officials that share our values. Not good people who we think might do it, right? Because how many times have we been stabbed in the back by that, right? But develop and elect people that we know share our values, like the mighty Sue Garza to my right. So I'm going to close with that. Thank you, brothers and sisters, for your time this morning. Who schools? Our schools. Who schools? Our schools. Oh, uh, no, you, you're not going to shut it down like that. Who's school? Our school. Who's school? Our school. Who's community? Our community. Who's community? Our community. Who's children? Our children. Who's children? Our children. Yeah, all right. Oh, good. Outstanding. Thank, Thank you so you. really good. Thank you. So you know G2 had to go first. <laughs> It's cool, it's cool, it's gonna be all right. I will say this, um, G2 and I were talking about this earlier. I met him in 2009 uh, after we planned as the Caucus of Rank and File Educators and our community allies um, a conference to talk about privatization, charter schools. It was in January in Chicago. And the night before, we saw the weather forecast it said there was gonna be you know, 12 inches of snow the next day. <laughs> Biggest blizzard that winter hit. We, we got to Malcolm X College on the west side, the near west side. 500 people made their way to that forum to talk about the privatization <laughs> of education. Teachers, parents, students all in the same space. That's where I first met G2, who knew the brothers and sisters who brought me into this struggle. Um, I met Sue Garza a couple years later um, when we were in, leading up to the strike. She scared me at first. <laughs> You're gonna see why in a minute. She's amazing. <laughs> these, these people have taught me so much. I'm young, but what I value most about the struggle in Chicago is that we are an actual community in the fight. I have never felt more like I belong to something than being a part of CTU and being a part of an alliance that is real, that is based on personal relationships and trust. So I'll say this, I came up, um, just wanted to be a history teacher. You know, I gave you some history yesterday and I got involved in CTU and I had to start wearing red shirts on Friday and uh, students, right, students saw us wearing those red shirts. And students asked us, why are you wearing those red shirts, right? And that means we were having conversations with our students about what it means to be a union member. Um, I was on the cover of the Sun-Times one year uh, because I was protesting the heat. We didn't have air conditioning in our Aww. school. And we had final exams one June, and it was 95 degrees in my classroom. I took a picture of the th thermometer. This was a part of a union campaign. And we would send our pictures to the union media team, and they would blow it up on social media. I ended up on the front cover of the Sun-Times. My principal didn't speak to me for the rest of the school year. Wow. <laughs> That's good. Congratulations. But, but guess what was even better and more important is my students bringing me copies of the paper, right? My students, you know, when there was another protest coming up, asking me, Miss Johnson, are you going to get arrested today? <laughs> and I would say, not today. Not today. Maybe another day. So in any case, it's that you know, people power, the community power, the relationships that we build, and I don't want us to leave our students and our student voices out of the equation. So in Chicago, you know, we've done a lot of work, but we had to make strategic choices. If you haven't seen David uh, Wiles' strategic choice model, it's very simple. I'm not going to take you all the way through it, but you got to find the leverage points, right? And you got to find the organizational capacity. And it took us, you know, a, a few years to build the organizational capacity to pull off the 2012 strike, right? It started with the relationships in core and developed over a long period of struggle, thousands of meetings, thousands of conversations with students, parents, and community. Um, Karen likes to use these questions, and this is kind of what we always bring ourselves back to, is what we're choosing to do going to unite us is what we are choosing to do going to make us stronger? Is what we are choosing to do going to build our power? 
And those are the questions that we keep in mind when we're deciding what the next strategic goal is going to be like trying to take out Rahm Emanuel. <laughs> So, you know, we faced a lot of challenges. We had a successful strike after a 90% yes vote. We got a contract with an 80% vote. We took Emmanuel to a runoff and we got 44% of the runoff. Chewy Garcia almost did it, right? But, you know, our conditions are really difficult in the schools. You know, a lot of them still don't have that air conditioning. We have a privatized janitorial contract that is leading to disgusting messes in hundreds of schools, garbage that's not being taken out, roaches in the schools. Um, we've lost, like G2 said, members over the course of the last 20 years, 10,000 really over the last 20 years because of the school closings and privatization. Privatization is the key. And now we have a GOP governor, Bruce Rauner, and a Democratic mayor, Mayor Emanuel, who, you know, pretend that they're not friends, right? But they are. They have a long history together, okay? And now our contract is expired and we're in negotiations under really difficult conditions. You know, we talked yesterday that part of our work was revitalizing the structures in our union. If you want more information about that, I would encourage you to buy the Labor Notes book called How to Jumpstart Your Union. You'll hear from all three of us in that book, actually. Um, and I did want to highlight a couple of things that I didn't talk about yesterday. Our bargaining process is one that includes our rank and file members. We have a 50 person rank and file big bargaining team that sits in on some of the negotiations. Um, and then I also wanted to mention that part of the, the priorities in our budget include an organizer who's dedicated to being the liaison to our charter school local, local 4343. So there's these strategic choices, right, that have to be made. At the center of our work is kind of empowering our members, right? Our members have to feel like this is a struggle that they have to be a part of, right? Regardless of whether their school is dirty, regardless of whether their school has a charter that's in the neighborhood, regardless of whether their school has low test scores and feels you know, threatened, we have to make people understand that solidarity is the only thing right, that is gonna help us win this fight against privatization, because it's not going to stop. And in order to do that, you know, we try to empower members. This is a quick little editorial from our union magazine from a teacher who'd been in the classroom for 15 or so years, but she hadn't been connected to the union. And this is her writing about how she was drawn in to the leadership and how she became a member of that big bargaining team and recognized that even though her school was kind of um, well-performing, not on the chopping block, that this was a, a fight she had to be a part of. Coalitions, <laughs> alliances is a huge part of our work. G2 mentioned GEM, um, the grassroots education movement. We work closely with a lot of other teachers unions like UTLA, St. Paul Federation of Teachers. We're doing some work with them right now on school climate and restorative justice. We're having conversations across our two locals and our states. Um, Y'all see the picture in the bottom right corner. I wouldn't call him an ally, but it's just a fun fact. You see who's in the bottom right corner? Yeah. That's Matt Damon, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, we, we, we have teachers who did work with um, the uh, Zins, Howard Zins, Voices of a People's History, and there was an event where um, one of my former students who's an amazing activist, Malcolm London, they performed speeches like Fred Hampton's speech, um, pow you know, Power to the People, and Matt Damon performed um, a historical speech too, and he took a CTU hat and wore it with pride, so <laughs> that's just fun. Um, a huge part of our efforts is research and telling our story. And I want to put in a plug for our new report. You may have seen the small one, um, the schools Chicago students deserve. But I brought some copies of our new report, Adjust Chicago. This is really about broadening the fight, right? It's not just about schools. It is about a broader fight. If you go to adjustchicago.org, you'll see a website where we have blog posts where we connect our contract campaign to the fights like the fight for $15 minimum wage, right? For a fight for fair housing, right? For a fight against food deserts. Um, all of these things that affect our students in the classroom. Violence in the community is out of control and where's Rahm Emanuel, right? What is he doing about police brutality in the city of Chicago? So right now we're bargaining, but CPS has a structural deficit. And CPS is, you know, they say a billion dollars in the hole. They're taking on 
another billion dollars of debt that was just um, voted on last week. So this is a very difficult climate to be bargaining a contract. So what we have to do, right, is in some ways acknowledge their brokenness, and that's a difference in our rhetoric from the past, but still remain focused on getting the schools that our students deserve and broadening it to a just Chicago. So our five pillars of our contract fight are educators are professional experts and role models. One of the things in that um, specific bullet point is get rid of the Teach for America contract. <laughs> right? Why is the board, if they're a billion dollars in debt, why are they spending millions of dollars on a contract with Teach for America? Okay? Uh, bullet two, the schools, Chicago, ooh, that's the wrong one. It doesn't say the right thing. It's supposed to be about, um, It's supposed to be more explicitly about privatization, so then it has to do with the cleanliness of the schools, okay? We already talked about that. Um, third, schools are anchors of the community. We are including in our bargaining this push for 50 sustainable community schools. You know, the union is making that a part of its actual table discussions. Four, students are human beings. Testing has to stop, right? Yeah. We could get into a discussion about our new work called Opt Out for Justice, right? What schools are impacted by testing? Schools that are low poverty, that serve students of color, and then those tests are used to reduce resources and close them. This is a justice issue. So right. opting out of testing is not just about, um, you know, not participating in giving Pearson money, although that's part of it, privatization. It's about students of color being abused by the system, and opting out is one way to approach that. Um, we're asking for restorative justice coordinators, fewer police officers in our schools. We have police officers in every high school. And finally, we acknowledge that educators cannot achieve equity alone. We are in this fight as a collective, okay? One of the ways that we tried to do that is changing the political landscape of the city of Chicago, and that's exactly how Karen always described it, changing the political landscape of the city of Chicago. We did create an independent political organization that we're still working on. We have a rank and file PAC committee, our political action committee, like your PACE. Um, they worked hard to vet candidates like the am amazing Sue Garza, who you'll hear from soon, and uh, folks like Chewy Garcia. Finally, I want to just touch on how we are now talking about this idea of broke on purpose to win a just Chicago, to win the schools our students deserved in this era where the board is trying to use those austerity arguments that we're hearing from around the world, right? So we created this fun graphic. When I first saw it, I was like, damn. We're not pulling any punches. You see, the, there's blood trickling out of the logo. This is the logo of CPS, our school district, Chicago Public Schools. Um, they, they use slogans themselves like, children first. We know that that is absolutely not the case. So we took their logo and we said, we're telling it like it is. You're saying you're broke, you're broke on purpose. You're investing in charters and not neighborhood public schools, right? You're giving contracts to Teach for America. So th these are some of the slides from a training uh, PowerPoint that we use with community members, with our teachers, in order to make them understand that the only way that we're going to get the schools we ne need and uh, adjust Chicago is by making the millionaires and the billionaires pay, okay? We know about you guys, um, your millionaires and billionaires out here in LA. We have Ken Griffin, who is the CEO of Citadel, a hedge fund, a massive hedge fund who is worth $6.6 .6 billion. He's the richest man in Illinois. Our governor, Bruce Rauner, is worth hundreds of millions of dollars. He has a charter school named after him, and he has seven, count them, seven private homes across America. Okay? Thank you. He spent $30 million of his own money, of his own money to become governor, okay? So we have to let our folks know that these are the same people who are telling us we don't deserve mental health clinics, we don't deserve neighborhood public schools, we don't deserve pensions, but they are making immense profits by the minute, okay? They tell us that we've got to cut and so we're telling our folks, what if we force them to pay? One of our current campaigns has been to uh, focus attention on faulty 
financial transaction deals, and you know, we've got a bunch of slides that really just break down how uh, banks and the, the millionaires twist financial deals to make profit off of education. So I won't get into it, but just from this faulty toxic swap deal, interest rate swaps, the banks are making over $1.2 billion, and CPS has lost close to five, look at the number. <laughs> how, many, how many numbers are on there? It's not hundreds of thousands, it's hundreds of millions of dollars because banks are profiting off of these deals. So currently, with our allies, the grassroots education movement, grassroots Illinois action, um, we are targeting Bank of America. You know, we, we've heard about we can't support uh, corporations that do bad union work, but we also can't support banks that that's basically, you know, take money from our children every day. One year of Bank of America's toxic swap could have saved 22 schools in Illinois, five schools in Chicago. One year of Bank of America's swap profits would have been enough to have a Southside trauma center. We do not have a Southside hospital that can treat gunshot victims in the Southside where we see uh, increasing violence. One year of swap profits from Bank of America could get a raise for nursing home workers in the Chicago area to $15. We got, we forced, you know, in our alliance, in our work, the minimum wage to be raised over time to $13, but that's not enough, right? Bank of America's swap profits could have funded early child care assistance programs, something that is under attack from our governor. So, you know, we're really talking about progressive revenue options in our alliances with our community partners, with our members, and saying enough is enough. And again, you know, we had to make choices, but we've made some big choices to take on some really powerful individuals um, and to say that it, we've got some leverage and this is gonna be the way that we're gonna change the political landscape in the city of Chicago. Thank you. Very good. Very good. Thank you. Wow. Awesome. 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 Yeah, that is awesome. Thank you. UTLA. <laughs> I love looking out and seeing a sea of red. I'm partial to red. Uh, my name is Sue Sadlowski Garza. Um, I need to give you a little bit of my background before I, I tell you about our organizing. Um, I grew up in, on the southeast side of Chicago, and it was a true mill town. We had 21 steel mills in a 30-mile radius. And when the steel mills closed, the jobs went with them. So my ward that I live in now is the biggest ward demographically in the city of Chicago. Uh, we have seven neighborhoods in our ward, and they're all segregated. And that's done on purpose because that's how the incumbent kept political control, right? So I grew, I grew up, my father was a labor leader who actually led uh, the Steelworkers Fight Back campaign in the 70s. So I was the kid who grew up in union halls and headquarters and woke, being woke up in the morning to go to gate pass outs and walk the picket line. Um, that was before I was six years old. <laughs> so um, I always grew up in a home. I was union strong from day one. So I, when, after I um, got out of high school, we never had high school fairs. It was always mill fairs. They would come and recruit at the high school. So I went to go work in the steel mill like my dad, like my grandfather, like my great grandfather. I went to work at Chicago Steel and Wire and I ran, I was 17 years old, I ran three box wire machines and had to lift up 75 pound spools of wire. And um, you worked on incentive and lifting those things of wire was really hard work and one Friday, we got paid every Friday and one Friday the foreman came over and said, Sue Sedlowski made incentive. And he gave me my check, two cents. Two cents incentive. Needless to say, I lasted six weeks in the mill and went away to college. <laughs> um, it was a life lesson. I actually got my bachelor's degree in psychology and I went back to work at South Shore High School as a lunch lady. And I made grilled cheese and salads. So I worked there for about two years, went back to school, got my master's, um, and went back to work actually after I, as a counselor in CPS at the same school that I went to sc uh, school at, 
my kids went to school at, and I worked there for 21 years. So I spent 46 years of my life in my neighborhood school as a student, a parent, and as an employee. 46 years of my life. And I was union delegate at my school, and my principal had the nerve to tell me that because I fought so hard for the rights in that contract, she had the nerve to tell me, you are going to be the demise of this school. <laughs> so I was kind of proud of not being the demise, but I was proud that she was scared of me. <laughs> so anyway, um, back to the thing. We, we faced 50 school closings. We, we did a lot of um, action in the streets. Um, I was arrested three times, one for blocking the elevators at the city of Chicago City Hall, same place that I work now. <laughs> so um, I, I have a great story. We, we did an action. Um, we actually, we got arrested in City Hall. Uh, we, we did a press conference where we delivered 10,000 signatures against school closings. And um, after that action, we left the mayor's chambers and everybody was gonna break out and grab an elevator and sit down and link arms and you know the drill. So my daughter was with me and I, said, I called her up. I said, hey, uh, you wanna get arrested today? She said, are you kidding? I said, no, some moms and daughters go to lunch. We get arrested in our family. <laughs> so we're sitting in the paddy wagon and uh, <laughs> You know, we're, we're, we're in zip ties in the paddy wagon and, and we're going around the paddy wagon telling everybody's introducing themselves to each other. And my daughter said, I'm with my mom. I got, we're arrested. I got arrested with my mom. How many daughters can say that? So, you know what? <laughs> I'm proud. I'm a proud union mom. <laughs> anyway. Wow. Um, Anyway, I, you know what, I fought really hard against the injustices that were happening in Chicago. And um, we were talking up here, on what we're going through in Chicago is, is the same thing that you're going through in LA and Philly, New Orleans. I mean, it, we know the drill. So um, I said on the executive board uh, for CTU, I said on the steering committee for CORE, and we talked a long time about taking back our school, taking back our power, taking back our city. So uh, the people that are making the policies in our school have no idea what's going on in the schools. So one of the things that we talked about is running for office and becoming the policy makers, right? So we, it, it, it was something that was thought about for a long time and we organized with, with black Block, block by block, community organizations. We did teacher in the pulpit. We talked about um, everywhere we went. We wore our red shirts on Friday. We engaged our students. We engaged our parents. Literally, teachers would walk outside after school and talk to the parents. You talk in the grocery store line. You just keep, you keep talking to people, and you make our struggle their struggle because in reality, it really is. You know, Jen talked about, you know, being in a 95 degree classroom, you know, our working conditions are their learning conditions, right? So, you know, you have to make it their own. We had to make it their struggle as well, and it was. And when we went on strike, 68% of the city of Chicago supported us. Yeah. Parents brought us food, barbecuing on the line for us. We had parents that would come and walk the picket lines with us. The amount of support that we had in the city was unprecedented unprecedented because they knew that we were fighting for them and it wasn't about wages or anything else it was about something that they that our parents and our community and our city knew was for a just Chicago and a just school system right so when we made the when we made the decision as a union to start running our members we ran 11 members and we Karen Lewis ran for mayor so um, I actually ran against a deeply entrenched incumbent. He held office for 16 years. He was a, a rubber stamp for Rahm Emanuel. Rahm Emanuel fed him $80,000 in campaign contributions. There were six candidates in the race against the incumbent. Um, after the February general election, I won, but I, but, 
it went to runoff. It went to runoff. So we had a cute, I mean, we were ecstatic. Election night in February, we were ecstatic. We were happy. And then I looked around and I said, oh, shit, we got to do this again. <laughs> um, I worked. I worked every day as a counselor with me, one counselor with 894 students. No aid, no anybody, me. And I campaigned at night. We had teachers from all over the city come to the 10th Ward and knock doors seven days a week. It was brutal. It was brutal. Uh, in April, we, had, we have signed affidavits from people that received the, the actual absentee ballot from people that worked on the incumbent's campaign. Their people showed up at doors with ballots for people to sign. I mean, it, it was crazy. In the end, I went to bed election night in April up by 98 votes. Mm. I woke up with one, we went to bed with one precinct not reporting. Mm. And I was up by 89 votes. The precinct that wasn't reporting was the precinct where my school was. So it, it was a nail biter, but anyway, needless to say, um, we waited two weeks. There was something wrong with the machine. We waited two weeks, and um, it was the longest two weeks of my life. But all in all, we came out triumphant. So now, <laughs> I won by 21 votes. <laughs> 21 votes. We are a great civics lesson in every single vote counts. But you know what? Like I said, it, it was a struggle. It was a long struggle, but we won. And it was, it was something that we worked towards for a very long time. And we organized around this for three, four years. It wasn't something that we just woke up one day and said, hey, we're going to run for office. So I, during the strike, uh, we had district supervisors, we had strike captains. I drove around in a 1991 Grand Marquis with 189,000 miles, painted with signs that said, shame on Rom, our schools, our year, you know, I mean, it was, I, w I made the front page of the Sun-Times in my strike mobile, <laughs> going from school to school all across the city, getting on top with a bullhorn and reading people, you know, on the line, which is something that we put out, a, a paper that we put out every day during the strike. But we, like I said, we organized around issues that people could really relate to. We, we had strike funds to get ready for the strike. Um, we have a PAC fund that people contribute to, uh, you know, we, we just organized around uh, grassroots issues. So I'm really proud to sit on the city council in the, in the city of Chicago. Um, I was summoned to Rahm Emanuel's office my second week of work for a private meeting. Ooh. I was told to come myself, but he had his guy sitting next to him. And he said, Alderman, I'm going to throw you a bone and put you on the education committee. Oh. I said, Mayor, why wouldn't you put an educator on an education committee? <laughs> Just saying. And he looked right at me and he said, I don't want a circus. Oh, well then. I said, I'm not in this for a circus. I mean, do, 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 do. I'm in this to create a Just Chicago. You need to step foot inside the schools and find out what's really happening. We don't have, we do have an educator now on our appointed school board, right? Yeah. But it, it, it would take me three days to tell you what's happening with our appointed school board. And it's, I can't believe that there, people aren't in jail. I can't believe that people don't go to jail for what's being done to our kids. And you know what, if, it, if it's one thing that I wanna tell you, we were talking, wouldn't it be awesome if we had a national strike on just one day? You know, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on.
Yes, yes, thank you very much. When education is under attack, what are you going to do, stand up? What are you going to do, stand up? I bet. Thank you very much, UTLA. Thank you, Chicago, G2, Jennifer, Susan. And as they leave us today, as they leave us, remember this line from G2. We heard from three people who are in the trenches, who are doing the work, not from some ivory tower. And they leave us with G2's words. The truth is simple. If it's complicated, it must be a lie. Thank you.